The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. I'm Patrick, Head of Technology at professional services firm Collins SBA. I'm a former financial advisor who just loves solving business problems and creating better client experiences using technology. Join me each week as we unpack the tech on offer to advise professionals, stay on top of tech trends and help you break free from the analysis paralysis experience when building and maintaining a great tech stack. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where your clients have the best wealth technology at their fingers. With NetWealth's next-gen client portal and mobile app, clients can view and manage their portfolio, assets, and accounts wherever they are. By adding external bank and property feeds to their NetWealth account, they can get a true picture of their wealth. And by giving them the ability to transact and manage their cash, they can feel in control of their wealth. A world of client engagement awaits. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Today, we're talking leveling up your advice generation and document writing process with Taylor Binden, Director and Developer at MOAS. You'll soon find out what the acronym stands for, but MOAS was born out of frustrations with existing systems and the reliance on manual processes involving Excel and Word. Taylor describes MOAS as the Google Docs of financial planners, but it's so much more than that. And it's really exciting to see a modern solution reducing the need for traditional word processing tools. I started by asking Taylor what the oldest piece of tech he still owns is and whether he still uses it. Yeah, cool. Um, oldest piece of tech, probably a record player, actually. Oh, nice. Yeah, I got a few hand-me-downs from my my auntie, like some some real vintage stuff, like some Led Zeppelin II sort of things. And I was like, oh, well, I have to find something to put it on, right? So, yeah. um yeah, I, I guess funnily though, like I've seen people online now uh, collecting CDs as well, and okay. like I sort of grew up with CDs, so yeah. now I'm sort of like, am I am I now the old fogey that's doing the weird thing? Do you know yeah. what I mean? No, exactly. And like, it's it's crazy what like is considered vintage now. I think it's like 20 years or something. Like it's it's really crazy, but that's really cool. And um, I assume if you see like a record store, you're sort of straight in there having a flick through. Like that's still something you do. When you're out and about, yeah, definitely still go for a sticky beak for sure. Awesome. Um, there's a few few cool records that I've found, and just albums where you, you know, like some old Queen and things like that, like uh, sort of iconic things. Like I'm not I'm not a huge collector by any means, but if there's something that stands out, then sure. Yep. Um, and yeah, even like local Aussie bands that I've been to concerts for or something like, if they've got one on display, then I'll grab that as well. So yeah, really cool. And I guess that's like where where sort of cover art really mattered like some of the i guess that's sort of what is um you know catching your eyes is things that, that sort of look cool rather than sort of spotify when it's just all the stre- any sort of streaming app where it's like really hard to get context or get attention a bit like like a youtube sort of thumbnail sort of thing um yeah, yeah. that's that's probably a good point actually like because you sort of go online and the cover art is still important, but it's probably you're probably more looking for artists that you already know of yeah, instead exactly. of going, oh, that looks that looks interesting. Like, let's give that a listen. So, yeah, nice. I guess sort of moving to yeah tools like obviously Spotify and where they're using like AI for playlists and things like that. Are there any you know one or two cool ways that you're using AI either personally or in your sort of work life? Yeah, I mean, main one for us as developers is GitHub Copilot. Okay. So, um, it's it's interesting. Like, it's it's helpful to get you up and running right but it doesn't have the context of your whole code base so i can't tell it hey write this new model for me or hey test out this calculation like i have to sort of give it quite a few prompts still to get what i need but it certainly it certainly helps i mean like testing code now is infinitely easier you can sort of set your test case and then just write minimal code um so yeah that's probably the biggest way i'd say that we're using ai at the moment yeah nice and i assume like, can you imagine life without it? Like, if that wasn't working one day, would you be like, like, damn, Copilot's down? Or would you be like, I can manage? Like, is it at that point yet? Yeah. It's, it's one of those things we're not quite there yet where okay. we can we could definitely manage. We just go back to the, uh, the I guess, the more manual way of doing things. Okay. Um, but it's certainly it's certainly almost at that point where once it's, once it's got our code base, like, in its 
understanding and its knowledge, mm-hmm. um, I think then it will be one of those things that will become very difficult to live without. Nice. It's exciting. Um, any day now. No, really cool. Okay. Is it, it Moas? Is it, am I pronouncing it correctly? I'm really keen to learn yeah, more. Mo- Moas is it. So if we, um, we started off, we, we had an Excel spreadsheet in the office called Moas, which was the mother of all spreadsheets. Nice. So that's where the names come from. Nice. The old acronym. Um, yeah, I work in a business called Collins SBA and I don't think I knew until sort of year five or six what that SBA stood for. Um, and yeah, sort of surprises <laughs> for anyone who can guess it. Um, it's largely irrelevant anyway. It's not about me, but yeah, I'd love to know more about, yeah, Moas, like, um, yeah, what is it and, and sort of where does it sit in the tech stack of a sort of financial planning firm or maybe professional services firm? Yeah, great question. So we sort of sit in the document production space specifically. Okay. Uh, obviously, that includes your modeling, your CRM. Uh, obviously, we have to have those things so that we can produce the documents. So take an example, maybe you're running my prosperity for your fact finding sort of data. You've got product recs for your product recommendation stuff. Yep. We sit in the middle of that where we're actually producing the document uh, online with you and through online templating as well. Um, so you can lock off content and things that you need. So it's easy to produce the same documents, but very personalized, tailored advice as well. Okay, cool. So you're doing um, the heavy lifting and you've got those other tools that are maybe designed to do obviously specific things, sort of elevating you to get the job done as well. Would that be sort of a fair assumption? Yeah, that's probably a good way to put it. We're um we're doing the the more general work in this in the middle there. So getting away from that, you know, word templated stuff. You, you're merging and downloading and uploading data and things are a bit jumbled. Uh, we're certainly trying to abstract that away. Okay, so it's a, it's a web app. It's not sort of exporting something to like a Word or a Google Doc and it's sort of game over. It's actually being edited um, in the app itself. Yeah, completely browser-based. So the the way we describe it is sort of like Google Docs for financial planners. Nice. So you've got your – you can drag and drop your models in. Uh, you can move them around the page, move your content, make things bold, change colors, have different themes for subdivisions or if you're a licensee for different businesses uh, that you're licensing as well. Okay. So it's it's sort of like a – everything becomes like a like a component or like a module. So you can sort of drag it in that sort of way, like it's sort of live on the page. Yeah, for sure. We we literally call the the stuff that we put on it components. So nice. words out of the mouth. So perfect. Okay. Awesome. That sounds um, you know, sort of I was gonna say twenty first century, but like this is in terms of like financial planning, like this is sort of uncharted territory in terms of tech solutions that are sort of working in that way. I mean I'd love to know I'd love to know more, but I'd love to sort of know like what's the like what's the origin story? Like how did you how did this come about and yeah, what made you build it? Yeah, good question. So, um, in full disclosure, mum, Carolyn Binden, she's a financial planner. So, uh, many glasses of red wine during uni and lots of frustration about existing solutions they were using and sort of trying to figure out how they can get away from the more manual Excel stuff and into a web-based platform. Um, And there were a lot of solutions they were using at the time, your general incumbents that sort of weren't really filling that, that space specifically there were other tools i had that were really really good like some of the modeling solutions are fantastic but actually doing the heavy lifting and making that document writing process efficient Mm -hmm. was just completely lacking um so where we started was we took the excel documents the offline data and put that into a crm essentially so with moas we've also got your contact details assets and liabilities that sort of stuff online uh, and then from there, we sort of went, okay, well, what low hanging fruit can we, can we pick here? How can we make the most of this quickly? And that was through annual reviews. So we started off with annual reviews. We had a, a set process for that that wasn't as interactive as the document is now. So it was sort of fill out your text boxes and they will then populate the document. Yeah. Um, so and then, yeah, from there we moved. Sorry. Sorry. So sort of inputs, outputs, but in a sort of guided sort of wizard way. Yeah, more like that, more like that. And then we sort of went, okay, well, how can we actually take this whole part of this process and make it be inside the document itself instead of this separate separate piece? So now the the process is very much do your modeling, jump straight into the document and and add things on the go. So Wow. And then like yeah, it's it's a, I mean it's a real like modern, like clean and sort of simple vibe uh from what I've sort of seen. Like I assume that was intentional. Like I assume you've tried to keep it modern day. Like can you sort of talk about that sort of um, 
like user experience process? Like how have you sort of gone about like keeping it simple? Because it's obviously like these are, are problems that are really complicated or at least, uh, you know, perceived to be that way. Like it really feels like you've sort of simplified it. Like can you sort of talk through that process of how you've got to such a sort of clean and simple design? For sure, yeah. So Lara, my business, other business partner, she majored in uh, user interface and user experience at university, okay. uh, as well as good. computer science. Yeah, so that definitely helps. Lara's Lara's a superstar with what she does. Um, and there's been many a time where Sammy, my, our other business partner, and myself yeah. have sat down and said, "Why don't we do this?" And Lara's like, "Yeah, but that's three clicks instead of one." You know, so it's it's actually that minutia, getting into that level of detail and going, well, if we have the model here, what sort of information do we need next to it? So you've got the correct context and okay. can we stop users flicking between pages sort of thing? And uh, that sort of, that's sort of where it starts and we go, okay, how can we present as much as we can in the simplest way that we can? Um, and then from there, it becomes about interaction. So mm-hmm. uh, how are people using it? What buttons are they pressing? Uh, is it taking too long for them to find the information they want to see? Uh, and that was first and foremost for us because if we if we couldn't do that ourselves while we're testing it and yeah. and setting it up, right, we know that it's going to be difficult for users after the fact as well. So uh, very a very iterative process where you sort of you get to a point where you go, this either is or isn't working, and then you start making changes around that as well. It's, uh, it's very refreshing to see that, yeah, sort of user experience is – sort of at least thought about like when you compare to sort of as you mentioned the incumbents there like and what you've sort of insinuated there is like you've you've consolidated the i think you referred to it as as offline data so into moas right and then you know you've eliminated that sort of context switching there but then you've gone one step further in moas itself right like you've gone okay now all this data is in here how do we then further limit that context switching and just make sure someone is able to do their job without you know jumping around is that sort of accurate yeah that's probably a good way to put it um we when we were setting up the the spreadsheets and the modeling for the soa component we the way you'd compare scenarios is you would have three or four different spreadsheets one would be your current recommended alternate sort of thing yeah and we went okay how can we still give that customization without having three spreadsheets and needing four screens and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so definitely I think you put it in the right words there, Patrick. Nice. No, that's, um, yeah, as I said, really refreshing. That's really cool. Um, Taylor, I'd love to do just like a sort of brief, or maybe not brief, but a functionality overview. Um, like from, as I said, what I've seen on the website and what you've sort of explained just now, like you appear to cover off on the essentials of financial planning. Like you've got the CRM, You've got advice doc generation, like even just ticking off that is, you know, piquing most people's interests, but you've gone sort of steps further there with the modeling. Um, we can talk about workflow. You've also got, uh, at least on your website, an advice fee calculator, and then you've got like reporting as well. I'm not sure if I've missed anything there in terms of functionality points, but there's obviously a lot to unpack there, but would you mind sort of starting with like CRM, like what's been the approach there? And like, what sort of things does that include? Like, and then I assume that sort of becomes the base for everything else, right? Like, once the CRM data is there, you can then move on to your other components or modules. Yeah, pretty much. So we, the way we started with it was when we looked at the data, we sort of went, okay, well, all of this is key to the rest of the functionality that we're going to need to build out. Yep. So for us, the main point was instead of having the data just flow through only to the modeling or something like that. We needed to make it accessible throughout the application per client sort of thing. So um, probably the best way to describe it is instead of being limited to using the data in certain sections, we had to be able to use it throughout the app and, and make it quite free flowing. Um, I know that sounds, that's a lot of words to just explain that we have the data online, but um, I think that was the biggest benefit. Instead of having it in a, a separate service on a separate server even or separate mm-hmm. database, it needed to be core to the whole application so that when we're doing documents, like we have access to the client names and that just little things like that. Um, so that was certainly the the biggest key for the CRM. Uh, and then, like you said, so uh, what we covered before, we moved into the review um space and yep. looked at that process yep. and that was very much leveraging that existing data 
Um, we then did take a little break between review and SOA because we obviously had to get the review up and running, started right. reporting on that. So what metrics have we got out of that? What's yeah. the timings like? That sort of stuff. Uh, and during that time, we started working on uh, tasks and workflow. And that sort of set us up for the live editing of the document. So each phase has sort of been incremental to the next one as well. But yeah, does, does that sort of answer the question or... Oh, definitely. Like I think as you, yeah, as you sort of confirmed, like the CRM is, is sort of the base for it. And then, you know, tools like Workflow, like that's a, a very, not say very easy, but a very, like it's an incredible way to get users spending most of their day in the tool, which then makes them or leads them to be probably naturally wanting more functionality, right? Like if you're if you're spending a day doing your workflow and your tasks, like that is then another yeah, sort of tipping point to go, what else can we possibly do in here, right? Yeah, definitely. And that was something we we were sort of hesitant, to be honest. We were like, oh, mm-hmm. look, do we really need to do workflow? Like we've got yeah. monday.com, click yeah. up, that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. And then looking back at it, we went, well, it's still pertinent to the client. So yeah. we still sort of need to have that relation there so that we know who's on first, what's on second. Um, if you're part of a team, what's going on for that team? Um, okay. So that actually let us set that up from a business perspective or even as a solo advisor, that it's a lot easier to see what client works ongoing. Uh, and again, yeah, that all came back to the CRM and having that that baked in. Very cool. No, that's awesome. And then as you sort of mentioned there with the advice document generation, so I started with the review documents and now that's then expanded to SOAs. What was that sort of process like? Was that, um, I assume it was pretty hectic in terms of what's required in an advice document, but then keeping it sort of clean and, and simple and sort of, you know, drag and drop nature. Do you mind sort of talking about how you sort of evolved to that SOA sort of wizard functionality? Yeah, for sure. So we, we sort of sat back and looked at it and went, okay, well, we now have, we had a multidiscipline firm, um, Carolyn's business, uh, yep. WealthMed, and they have separate divisions within that business that mm-hmm. do retiree specific, medical specific, professionals, insurance only. So there were lots of different use cases. And the primary problem with the review was it was just the review just for the planners. So we sort of went, okay, we've got all these great tools and models and things in spreadsheets. How can we get that again, all online, but then give people enough customization to be able to have um, maybe just a position statement report, for example, or a, a two page ROA, um, or maybe the full, a full, um, annual review document, full SOA. So there were lots of use cases we had to cover there. And we sort of started from the point where we wanted people to be able to template these documents so that you don't have to like with Microsoft word, right? Like when, yeah, you, you basically start with something where you've got a few headers put in and then you go from there. So, uh, we started with the templater and that sort of paved the way for how we wanted to interact with the document. So mm-hmm. we sort of went, okay, well, what feels natural for us in order to interact with this? Can we drag and drop this? Can we just pull, put the model in here? Uh, and then how do we make choices? Can we duplicate pages? If we duplicate the page, can we display different information on that page? Um, so we started with the templater because that gave us that that core data structure as well. So, you know, pages, sections, content yeah. components that sort of thing uh, and then from there we moved into the actual process of writing the soa which ironically is probably the easiest part um okay. it was it was the hardest from the live editing part like that was mm-hmm. particularly tricky mm-hmm. um but the difference between the template and the soa was just that um we had to be able to add the data directly into the document so right. that was the main link so by the time that we'd done the template and we got to the soa we were like oh actually we've, we've pretty much finished everything we set out for before we've even got here which was which was great so yeah nice no that's really cool and then i assume i think you're sort of leading this on the website that your document templater or the tool is actually allowing you to produce soas in an incredibly fast time compared to sort of those incumbent tools or even you know microsoft word or sort of you know mail merging a excel spreadsheet is that is that something you want to expand on there yeah, for sure. So uh, when we started working with WealthMed, they did an internal audit of their annual review process, and it was right. averaging about seven hours and 20 minutes uh, per review. And so that was our target. We were like, great, if we can come in under that, then we'll be home and hosed. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we ended up producing about 1,200 annual review documents with them over two years, and the average mm-hmm. time was two hours and 10 minutes. Wow. So we went, great, like this is a, a fantastic starting point for us. How can we now leverage 
these efficiencies into the SOA process. Uh, and already we're, we're hitting similar numbers, like we're looking at four to five hours for SOAs. So, you know, two or three of those within a day. And these are still mm-hmm. large, complex documents, um, mm-hmm. just with the way that the AF- AFSL is being run. Yeah. Um, but there's certainly scope there for advisors. Uh, we've got some solo advisors that are doing three or four page SOAs or ROAs and statements that are that done in 15, 20 minutes, um, wow. which is truly amazing. Um, and it's about having that continuity of data as well. So because we can store asset positions and historical positions, we can project out what's happened previously and not only just going forward. Um, so being able to take that, like a review is a great example, right? So yeah. the fastest thing for a review would actually be to plot the historical data instead of projecting what's coming next. Because that's sort of justifying, well, we're reviewing your position. This is where we're at. And then mm-hmm. obviously the projection is then where we're going. So, um, yeah, so there was, there's lots to consider with, with all the efficiency stuff and how we built it in. But that was our that was our starting point with the reviews. And then, yeah, we're still well on track at the moment with the SOA stuff too. Yeah, that's – no, that's sort of mind-blowing. That's really cool. That's sort of uncharted territory. And are you sort of suggesting there too with the template of that really you could create any type of document for the business in that tool like it's not just limited to advice documents right like if it's a if it's repeatable like if you have a template for it you can do it like are there any other examples of other types of documents that their you know clients or users are producing yeah yeah for sure so um yeah like i said we wanted to have that the ability to have the 100 page soa if that's your thing or the ability yeah. to do a one page statement and anything in between um okay. as developers we have to account for zero to infinity there's there's yeah. no in between it's in between. always the max or the minimum mm-hmm. and um yeah so other users we've got are doing insurance statements insurance only advice we've got finance and property that are doing okay. um almost portfolio statements as well so here's your current properties here's their associated loans this is what the cash flow is looking like based on rental income as well. Um, so there's lots of scope for for different documents in there. And, and like I said, even just the breadth of what you can do in the advice space with position statements and small catch-ups, ROAs, things like yeah. that is Strategy papers, very... Strategy that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Actually, that's a good one. We've got some... It's like a pre, pre-advice pre document or a, sorry, strategy scoping. There we go. Okay. So the strategy scoping document that one of our firms is doing is sort of pre-advice. So they set up their models, all the data and everything, confirm it with the client and check that that process is done. And then once that's it, they've already got the models and everything set up. So that goes straight into the SOA document and they just write the comments and recommendations in that document itself. So even using documents as pre-documents to make the document even quicker if that makes sense yeah cool no that makes a lot of sense like practically as well like the soa at least i believe it shouldn't be a surprise to clients in terms of the advice that they're receiving so it makes a lot of sense to sort of do that which can really become like an advice request right like we're we're plotting all this out in a formal way it's actually probably still engaging for the client because they're involved and they're approving it and they're actually going to like they're essentially giving the go ahead to yes do this additional work on on this advice document rather than a sort of big chunky hundred pager and you know they don't agree or maybe something's wrong in terms of assumptions or current position like that makes a lot of sense and I so, you sort of mentioned there like um, you know it, it really is like a multi divisional or cross divisional tool right so does that um, does that sort of translate to the modeling as well when you're talking about sort of finance or or property stuff too? Like, do you mind sort of going into um, the modeling side of things and how you sort of approach that? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, we've got uh, good examples are uh, offsetting and property cash flow. So, offsetting a home loan is probably something that a, a broker may or may not advise. It may or may not be financial advice. I'll, I'll okay. give the disclaimer. Yep. Yep, yep. Um, but that's certainly a strategy, right? So if you talk to a broker about opening an account, an, an offset account specifically, how does that affect your repayment schedule and, and the yeah. longevity of the loan? Property cash flow is a good one. At what point will the property be positively geared? How does negative gearing come into play there? Um, from a financier's perspective as well, there's quite a lot of detail in those strategies that you can implement. So instead of just going, hey, we recommend you buy a second property, you obviously now you have to give a lot of reasoning as to yeah. why uh, and also how that strategy plays out long term. So maybe the client does have surplus income for now, but in the mm-hmm. future, they might be looking at changing job or changing career or retiring. So 
can we get those properties to a positive position before we uh, continue on there? So lots of scope and flexibility in that respect. Uh, we've also got some insurance modeling as well. So okay. sort of needs analysis, I'd say. So more so yeah. your existing assets and liabilities, what a suggested cover might be. And then obviously the advisor is free to uh, add a recommended cover. That's obviously differing to whatever the calculation may be. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, lots of lots of different opportunities there. Uh, also, even accounting space, we have our, our cash flow breakdown. So uh, oh. it's not 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 um, not zero level of detail. I'd say it's probably more yeah. along the lines of an ITR. So gross net rental income. Are you making any contributions to assets or extra contributions to liabilities? What are your repayments? And then obviously surplus income left over as well. Um, so yeah, definitely lots of room for multi-divisional practices or even subdivisions of existing businesses, third-party yeah. accounting firms as well for solo okay. advisors that might be working with them. So yeah, lots of room there. Yeah, nice. And I suppose that just sort of is another strength for the power of CRM or having everything in one place, right? Like if it's there, basically anything's possible, especially if you're sort of tail of the developer and sort of GitHub um, co-pilots on as well and sort of working well. No, that's really cool. And then I assume that's all sort of interlinked. Is is if you talk about like different modeling scenarios, would it be fair to assume that you can throw maybe the scenarios that didn't make the cut into maybe the alternative strategies of an SOA or even a record of advice? Like how does that sort of look? Yeah, absolutely. So the way our scenario modeling works is we have, like we said, the CRM with the core client data. And in order to do the scenario modeling, um, we've got a little scenario button and that basically takes a copy of that client data, but slimmed yeah. down specifically for the modeling. So an offset account might in, in the modeling might literally just be a name and a value because you know, obviously yeah, there's okay. no interest on offsets, that sort yeah. of thing. So yeah. keeping that nice and concise. Um, but then you could make changes to that scenario. You can duplicate it. So you could have three or four on the fly. Uh, and basically if you, don't add any info to a model for that scenario. So let's say we've got our current and recommended and we've got an, an offset, uh, a home loan uh, model. Mm-hmm. Uh, the current could just be the existing loan schedule and then the recommended could be offsetting that account. So, And then maybe we've got an alternate and let's say we just haven't put anything in for the alternate on that specific model, then yeah. that won't show up. So that way you can have your current recommended an alternate, but maybe the alternate is only applying to your SMSF model, for example. Um, So yeah, definitely room to add, like we said, zero to infinite of of what you need there and and fit that all in. Yeah, far out. Yeah, so as you said, sort of can be as simple, as complex as you want. Um, You sort of mentioned um, an SMSF there. Does that mean that you're sort of supporting, and this probably becomes more relevant to as you go sort of cross-divisional, like you're handling entities as well, not just sort of individual or joint accounts, like it's, you know, entities like SMSFs, family trust companies, that sort of thing? Yeah. So the way we structure the data is um, we have, for example, the John and Jane Doe group, and they may have entities within that. It could just be John Doe. It could just be Jane Doe. Um, Maybe it's just John, but we're only doing entity stuff for him. So that's how we sort of set up is that the entities are just a part of that group structure. Uh, obviously they can have assets and liabilities as well. So a, a financial position essentially. And then, yeah, based on if the entity owns a property, for example, we can then assess the income differently from there. Yeah, awesome. So you can keep it simple or ramp it up. Like, it's awesome. I mean, there's a lot of, yeah, just sort of rounding out the modeling side of things. Like there's a lot of focus on building like great sort of long-term projections. Like how, what's the approach been to, like clients tracking progress to projections? Like obviously it's been maybe a year or or two years since that model was done. How does that sort of work in in the app or in the platform of when a client's coming in for review? Is that really tracking where they are now? We can obviously talk about sort of integrations and and that sort of thing uh, a little bit later. But yeah, how how does that sort of look? Mm, so what we do is we take a snapshot of the client's position whenever you provide them with a document. And that way, so there could be three or four documents within within the year and we just collect that obviously at whatever date that was recorded. And that way we can uh, plot all of that retroactively. You can also import or add your own historical data from previous advice oh, you've nice. given too. So okay. we, um, when we started this with WealthMed, one of the key things was with that annual review, they've had clients that have been with them for 10, 15 years. So making sure that we can actually have that data in that says, hey, this is where we've come from. 
Uh, what's actually been really interesting about that is sort of the the breakdown and discussion with fees as well. Instead of going, hey, well, like I know that we might get there, but what are we paying you for? You can actually mm-hmm. justify to your client like, hey, this is everything we've done for you and this is why. Um, so that's been a really interesting piece there. But predominantly, yeah, we're taking snapshots of financial positions whenever those documents are produced and that way we can pull those up and plot them straight away. Yeah, okay. No, that's really interesting. Like I think that historical data import is really interesting too. Like to like if we're chopping and changing systems every couple of years based on how technology is moving, like that can be pretty disruptive for clients but also, yeah, just the advice experience. But to learn that you can import what has happened in the past and show clients what has happened rather than what is happening, like that is a, yeah, as sort of said, it goes a long way to providing sort of peace of mind and, yeah, showing tangibly what you've done for a client, right? Like that is, I've said before that, you know, financial modeling or sort of projections are the one of the few tangible things that we do for clients. So it's really important that it looks good and it is actually engaging, right? Yeah, and even use cases too. Like the historical data for us is great for for any client. Um, good examples are your wealth accumulator versus your capital maintenance phase. So actually right. saying, hey, your capital maintenance, right? Your account has been growing, and we have been taking income from that account, but it's actually stayed yeah. at the same level over the last ten years, which is what we were expecting to do. Mm-hmm. And then it also sort of verifies your projections too, because if you've got that historical aspect yeah. looking back you can go well i mean what's what's the saying historical performance isn't indicative of, of future yeah. performance but in this case yeah. it sort of can be yep. <laughs> yeah yep. so um that, that's an interesting one but yeah when you look back on the capital maintenance stuff as an advisor you then have that confidence to actually say well you know what it has worked over the last 10 years we're going to follow the same pathway of what we've set out and we will achieve those results yeah nice and that really sort of validates like a no change advice document, like no change is still advice. But if the client can clearly see why in terms of what's happened and clearly what they're doing is working, then why why change a good thing or why, why change something if it's not broken or if it's, um, you know, working? That's awesome. Um, yeah, anything else you want to add on the on the modelling side before I sort of um, talk about workflow? Yeah, I think, I think that's been pretty comprehensive, yeah, feeling okay. pretty comfy there. Yeah, nice. Awesome. Um, yeah, so we mentioned, or well, you mentioned, sorry, not me, workflow around the, I think that really came came to fruition with the SOA stuff you mentioned, like in terms of when there was lots of time being saved and that sort of thing. Um, how does that sort of expand out now? Like I notice on your, or I note on your documentation, you've expanded that to things like, you know, advisor pipelines and opportunities and things like that. Do you mind sort of taking us through what sort of workflow means to you or means to MICE? Yeah, for sure. So we run uh, projects, tasks, and opportunities. So the way I like to explain it is a task might be an address change where you have to yep. go and check a bunch of boxes to make sure that you've changed addresses in 50 different platforms. Yep. Uh, an opportunity could be an upcoming SOA, upcoming piece of advice, multidisciplinary firms, upcoming uh, properties that you're sourcing, things like that. So something that has a revenue value assigned to it. And then right. projects we break down into phases and tasks. So a project may be a, an annual review and the first phase right. could be data collection, which could consist mm-hmm. of different tasks. So maybe a 15-minute uh, quick chat with a client and then um, jumping online, checking data. And then the next phase could actually be the modeling sec- and the third phase could be document production. Uh, so that's how we sort of break things down. Okay. No, awesome. So what you're sort of saying there is tasks. tasks are – sort of one-off things like client calls, as you said, address change, projects. Uh, another example might be uh, when we have our fee disclosure statements, we've promised the client that we're going to do these 12 things and the project might reflect that. So yeah. I might say we're going to do all of these things for you in this sequence or in this sequence on the advice side, but the client sees that in terms of deliverables. So just make sure that you've got consistent, you know, clear business process and nothing slipping through the cracks. Um, that's awesome. And the opportunities means that the advisors, I assume that's another reason to ditch the spreadsheets or the, the sort of free project management tools where advisors are tracking, you know, the deals and revenue and things like that. It keeps it in one place. 
Yeah, for sure. And that, that sort of opens up, you know, opportunity for us looking at integrations down the track with the revenue side okay. of things. So maybe like a, a zero integration where if you're expect, expecting X revenue, we know that you actually have generated Y from this client or vice versa. Yep. No, awesome. And then I, I assume that as you've got that workflow and the, so yeah, tasks, projects and opportunities in the system, that can then zoom out to sort of business-wide reporting. Do you mind sort of talking about that a little bit? Yeah, so that's that's exactly the the intent. We um okay. we sort of when we started Tasks, actually, we went sort of too granular. Uh, working with Carolyn and Scott from WealthNet, we sort of went into we wanted to get an understanding of how the processes were working within the business. So, what sort yeah. of time are you expecting to allocate and whatnot? And we've essentially scrapped that, and we're just tracking the day that it was created in the background and then the day that it's completed sort of thing. So uh, that's yep. sort of where we set the reporting up for. But obviously within that, that gives us a whole host of um, different opportunities. So projects is a great example. If a yep. project is completed or closed at any given phase, we can actually identify at what phase that has been finished or finalized. So um, we could have maybe three different annual review projects and maybe they all break down at the modeling step. So maybe there's something there as a business that we're not interacting enough with with the client in that stage of the the process. Right. So, uh, and then with tasks and opportunities, yeah, like you said, being able to take those those data driven values and actually come back and go, okay, well, how many opportunities do we have? What have our advice costings been for this month? And do they compare? Are they comparable? Are they miles off? Um, what are we missing? How much have we got outstanding? Um, so definitely being able to get an understanding of how much work you have left over and how much work you have outstanding and, and whether you can complete that as well is, is is sort of what we're focusing on so that things, like you said, don't fall through the cracks. Yeah. No, awesome. It, it makes a lot of sense. And, and I assume um, if you've got that visibility of data, you can see how long things are taking, uh, where it's falling down, that can really help you uh, price your advice as well. And I notice you've got an advice fee calculator um, embedded in there as well. Do you mind sort of taking us through that? It sounds like yet another spreadsheet that's going in the bin as well. For sure. The, the irony is it actually looks like a spreadsheet at the moment. So, right. Yeah, uh, you got to make it familiar. Yep. That's right. And I think... Baby steps. Yep. Yeah, with advice costings, it's, you know, uh, the way we approach it is it's it's uh, quite literally hourly costing. So I've worked okay. X hours on this part of this service that we're offering you Um and the main thing with this is that the pay structure can be split. So maybe thirty percent right. is for John, forty percent is for Jane, and the, mm -hmm. re the remaining thirty percent is for their their entity or SMSF or something okay. like that. So being actually able to identify which um, person is going to be paying for that service. Uh, obviously, if you're providing yeah. advice to an SMSF or a super, then that's sort of why that's there. Uh, also businesses and accounting, things like that for entities. Maybe you've been yep. doing uh, some entity management there. But yeah, primarily it's the the hours associated with the services you're providing the client. Okay. Awesome. And I assume that just provides more rigor to the advice process. So you're actually charging for your time, which is, yeah, a, a traditional way to, to price, but it obviously it makes sense. And also, I guess potentially that's something to share with clients to improve like transparency on how we arrived on that figure for sure depending on how you're invoicing them i guess yeah so we have components within the document where you can add all the detail as much or as little as you want into the document yep. that you provide the client as well so um one of our clients actually does it as a separate document so it gives the advice okay. and then gives the advice costings behind it as well in in the full detail um some of our advisors just use the the service types so for example mm -hmm. annual review is a heading portfolio restructuring as a heading and, and using those as identifiers instead of like the minutia right. and the individual steps gotcha. within that. Um, but yeah, being able to use that as part of the process is, is really important as well. Nice. So it, it more, some of them are doing like a summary view of, as you said, sort of the scopes of advice, whereas as you said, there might be other yeah, minutia or clients that sort of want that or require that and, and that's entirely configurable and up to the, the user, I guess, on probably a per advice document basis too, right? I guess it doesn't have to be business-wide. It could be per client. Yeah, absolutely. So we do have um, a templating ability for that as well. And we, we do okay. have templating for tasks and stuff too, I should have mentioned. But 
Yeah. So the ability to say, okay, well, I'm doing an annual review. We know that we have to have these required services. So like an online access or a document production charge is is a guaranteed, Mm -hmm. right? Um, But obviously then within that is very subjective. So maybe the review is just specifically for an SMSF. So we're not going to be looking at any of the property services that we offer and that sort of stuff. So yeah, giving you some structure, but still the flexibility to to personalize and tailor that. Nice. No, that's that's really cool. And yeah, like it's a massive achievement, like in terms of the functionality that you're um, that you've got in one system. Like it's just it's honestly unheard of. Like it's just it's massive. So well done. Like, would you say, like, is there a piece of functionality that you're maybe the happiest with or the most proud of? Um, off the top of your head? Oh, for sure. I mean, the the templating and the live editing is yep. it's sort of one of those things. I'll, I'll say this personally as a developer. It's one of those things where you see it happen in Google Docs, you know, and you see people editing in real time. But then when you get into the yep. background of that and actually look at how that works, oh, man, it's it's a headache. But once you yep. get it sorted, it's incredible. Like it's it's the coolest feeling for us when we're testing to be typing and seeing each other's curses and watching things move around. And yeah, it's just, okay. that that's probably the coolest thing as a feature that, that I love personally. Um, yeah. So it really is that sort of, as you mentioned, that sort of Google doc or, or live document experience. Yeah. I, I imagine that sort of like, as you sort of alluded to there, like a, um, you know, a peaceful sort of swan on the river, but then under it, it's Taylor with the, um, the sort of legs spinning under there to make that all come together. Like that's yeah, I'm, that's I'm, really I'm cool. still here like a manual phone operator, you know, plugging in the cords and <laughs> trying to connect yeah, things yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, nice. No, it's that's really cool. And I assume, like, I know it's just probably a small thing, but that would maybe help like remote teams feel more connected if they know that someone's working on that at the same time as them, or even in the same office. Sometimes people don't even sort of check on it, what's going on next door. Um, yeah, like is is there any sort of merit in that or like, yeah, why did you sort of pick to go, let's have this like fully live to the second in terms of this live document editing? Yeah, great question. We, I, I think we, I always say that tech gets all the cool stuff first and all the innovation first and then that sort of gets um, translated into other industries. And okay. I think for us, we use a lot of very high tech solutions for design software, for coding software. Yeah. We have similar editing interfaces for our coding where we can both or all three of us do it at the same time and see curses and things. So for us, it was actually just sort of like the next logical step. But with what you said, Patrick, that was spot on. So we've actually had some of our clients, uh, some of our businesses just get away with power planning briefs completely. They've just gone, we're not doing a brief. We're going to catch up on a Monday morning for five minutes. All of our file notes are on the front page of the advice doc, or not in the document, actually is like in the the module itself. Um, And if you have any questions, pop it in Teams or pop it through there, add a note or something on a model, and we'll just catch up on a Monday or Friday morning and and go from there. And so that was, that was ironically something that was a, a, a byproduct of of the live service thing that we didn't really we didn't really think of you know the working from home or the outsourcing or anything we just sort of went hey these are modern features that we think should be a part of it which was uh, it, it ended up working out really really well I mean I, I don't know how many times yeah, I've had awesome. Carolyn go hey I've sent off this power planning brief and it's come back three weeks later completely different to what I was expecting and then you you know it delays you further mm-hmm. so having that instant communication and connection gives you a whole lot of other benefits. Um, yeah. Like we just talked about. So. Oh, definitely. Like it just, it gives so much more context and yeah, it's a great way to um, communicate effectively. That's awesome. Um, I guess speaking of like sort of communication or engagement, like it really is engaging users of the tool from like a client perspective, like a client's logging in, like how are they interacting apart from viewing the, I'm not going to say hundred page SOA, I assume they're viewing that in a web app as well, but like, yeah, how does the sort of client experience look? Yeah, great question. So at the moment, we're working on a client portal and we're starting our data feed piece as well. Okay. Um, so that will very yep. much be the next step there is sort of getting that client engagement a bit higher. Obviously, with the document and the way things are set mm-hmm. out, we're really happy with the product that our advisors mm-hmm. are producing for clients. Uh, yeah, the next yep. step will be, can we get them into the portal and can we do the modeling online? Maybe we have like a, a playroom essentially where the advisor can adjust models on the fly and do it with clients all online in one spot. Uh, at the moment, you know, yep. some of our advisors are sharing screen and that sort of thing and doing it in real time with clients, yep. which is great. 
Um, but actually being able to have clients sort of log in and have their own experience there is, is definitely something on the cards. Yeah, okay. No, it makes sense. And But even the screen sharing of something that looks really nice and is easy to follow like goes a long way. So they're already engaged in that regard. No, that's really cool. I mean, you sort of touched on the – a little bit on integrations there like do you need to integrate with other tools like is there that requirement if you've sort of built those sort of key essential functions of or find your planning software or, or what's sort of the plan or approach there to integration yeah I, I love this question about integration because when we started out yeah the some of the advice we got from um, some people in industry was integrate 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 and figure out product later and now we're a team right. of three right so if we wanted to manage 20 APIs over the last five years, I don't think we'd have survived or made it to this point. Right. So we sort of went, look, yep. we need to have a product that actually serves a purpose and fills a specific Stand role yep. before we know what we want to assist it and, and further enhance mm-hmm. it. Uh, so now we're at the point where, look, we don't do product recommendation stuff, but obviously there's tools like Product Rex out there that we're super keen yep. on integrating with. Um, there's other insurance pl- uh analysis platforms like think of omnium for example omnium is a good mm-hmm. a great industry example mm-hmm. where they've got such yeah. fantastic insurance specific info that that's something that we could leverage so uh yeah. and then sort of the main one is data feeds right i think it's been done so many times in so many different ways that has created so many different challenges and obstacles i think mm-hmm. being able to find the right solution to that is really important um, obviously the yeah. likes of open banking now has started adding your interest only periods, your expiry dates, um, lots more info there right. that's all been standardized yeah, as well. Okay. So instead yeah. of managing oh, nice. 20 different APIs that all do it differently, we're now mm. dealing with one that handles it the same. Um, so yeah, it's, it's sort of, I think we sort of came from a place where we had to find what was going to really benefit the document as a process and as a platform and then now we're starting to look at adding those key integrations that are really going to make it absolutely fly nice no i really love the approach like actually having a a product that um can exist and do all of those heavy lifting things without needing integration like yeah to get rid of that distraction i assume has really helped with the own your own development of the tool right like it just becomes something you don't think about at least the immediate term and you can focus on on building and not relying on third parties, filling that void. Oh, massively. Um, that's really cool. Nice. Um, I mean, you sort of alluded to there, but I'd love to just quickly talk about, you know, what's on the roadmap or development path. Like you've already essentially solved financial planning. Um, are you trying to solve other industries? Or what's what's on the development path, Dan? <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, so for now, I, we'll stick to planning. Uh, we've, we've really okay. just yep. put, our, put our foot in the water, to be honest. Um we went to market okay. in October last year. Um, so we're really just yeah. starting to get out there and start talking to different businesses. Um, so yeah. really client portal and data feeds, those are sort of interrelated for us. Yeah. So having clients yeah. be able to log in and access the advice you've produced, um, being able to connect their accounts online so that we can sync that info. Yeah. Uh, like I said, product Rex, we've just um, had a chat with Nick and set up a dev account yeah. so we can start working on that. Uh, nice. insurance feeds and document signing. Those are things that are probably after those first two key pieces. Uh, then there's all the nice to haves. I mean, there's like your MailChimp thing mm-hmm. you can do where you can, uh, communicate with your whole client base from the CRM. So taking on more of that CRM role as opposed to like a, yep. a client data management system, which is probably more where we're at at yep. the moment. Um, and then look, biggest one is, is AI as well. I know we sort of talked mm-hmm. about it a little bit at the start, but, We've seen businesses like Canva, Figma implement an AI system that is, hey, can you go and create me this this visual image or can you create me this piece of content and it will start doing that for you. Um, What's interesting about that is that you have to give the AI lots of context on how your program works and how your API works. So if we can get to a point where we can start doing that, I'd love for someone to be able to go, hey, can you spin me up this document with these scenarios? They're going to change the way they're contributing to their their super. Um, they're going to be doing some salary sacrificing or something. And then the scenarios and the document are just gone and produced in the background. Bang. Hey, your stuff's ready. Yep. Come in and check it. Like that for us is probably the the end goal of where we want to get to. Yeah. Oh, that's no, that's really cool. And I'm sure that is just sort of around the corner when it comes to um, how AI, or at least in a generative way, is going. Like, that's really exciting. 
Um, yeah, Taylor, thank you so much for your time, mate. Like, how can someone learn more about MOAS and, and sort of get started? Yeah, um, best way to learn more about us, jump onto the website, moasapp.com. Uh, we've got documentation on there as well. So it's all free and open source that everyone can check out, have a read through. Uh, documentation is still a work in progress. So if you find a blank page in there that says coming soon, that's gotcha. why. Uh, otherwise, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, it's all just at Moas App. And yeah, um, feel free to jump on the website. We've got scheduling and demos available as well if anyone wants to find out more and more than happy to send out some fact sheets and things too. Awesome. Taylor, thanks again. Really appreciate it. No, fantastic. Thank you, Patrick.